Well, good morning and welcome to Cornerstone Fellowship Church Online. Today is a, a special day. Today is a day uh, where we celebrate and commemorate a day in biblical history called Pentecost. This is the day of Pentecost. And there's so much behind this day that I can't really elaborate too much on it. But one thing I want to say is that this was a day of change. This was a day of transformation and power. It was the beginning of miracles, things that people didn't ordinarily see. This was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. This is our call to worship, but before we go there, I'd like to read you a scripture verse and share a, a beautiful thought with you this morning. This is found in Acts chapter 2, verse 1. It said, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This was the day, just about six weeks prior, was the Feast of Passover. And in, in the Bible, there are basically three important Jewish feasts where the Jewish nation came to Jerusalem to celebrate. And here they were, about 50 days. That's what Pentecost means, 50th. It was 50 days after Pentecost. And this is a day where people came to celebrate and pray and be reminded of God's goodness. But as they came together, something happened here. And this is something that was prophesied in the Old Testament as well as the New. It was cited by Jesus in his post-resurrection to his disciples. And he told them not to do anything until they were clothed with the power from on high. This is something that revolutionized everything. It was the birth of the church. With 120 or so believers in an upper room praying, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit falls on them. There are tongues of fire that rested upon them. And by the way, fire in the Bible is, it denotes God's divine presence. It was at this point that God's presence was about to enter people's hearts and lives and change them forever. This was something that changed us and made church possible today. And I want to assure you this morning that we here are celebrating with all of the joy that we could possibly give this morning. I'm reserving my emotions this morning. I am on high because I want to celebrate this day. This day is a day where we saw signs and wonders. People spoke in tongues, but those were just signs and symbols. And tongues was a gift, which we still is still administered today by the Holy Spirit. But what the Holy Spirit did that day, it fulfilled prophecy and inside of every person that accepts Christ. It was this what we call the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's not another spirit, but it's a subsequent experience. And it helps us to be full of God's presence. It helps us to love God and to serve God and to want to do things that we've never done before. It gives us courage to speak with love the great gospel. It helps us to understand God's ways and it helps us to love God and people more than we've ever done before. So this morning as we enter into worship this morning, if you have never experienced the Holy Spirit in this capacity, it could be yours today. This is a promise from the Father, and the Father will not deny his children the gift of the Holy Spirit. All you need to do is ask. So our hope and our prayer this morning is that you would be filled with the Spirit this morning so that you can experience God in a new dimension, in a new reality. So let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you. We thank you, God, that we can stand in this moment in time knowing that something that happened over 2,000 years ago still exists today. So we bless you today for your spirit, and I pray that your spirit through this service, Father, would touch the hearts and lives of people. 
Lord, this promise is for everyone, not just for adults, but it's for children and families. Father, this is something that you've given to us. This is yourself that you've given to us. And Lord, today we can rejoice. So I pray this morning, God, that you would pour out your spirit, that you would give us another day of visitation, that we would see you, Father God, in all of your glory. And God, that people would be saved and transformed by the power of God. Father, we are blessed this morning to join together. And now as we open our hearts to singing, I pray, God, that we would give you our best and that we would lift our voices, our hearts, our hands, our minds, everything within us, God. May we worship you this morning and may you be glorified and exalted. In Jesus' name we pray. Come and join us in worship this morning. Come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit, come to this house, come Holy Spirit, come in all your power, come in all your glory, come in all your goodness, come Holy Spirit. Fill us, Lord. You were the word of the beginning. One with God, the Lord most high. You hid in glory. Now revealed in you our Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus. You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. Hidden glory Revealed in you are Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. Didn't want heaven without us, so Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. Worthy of all praise. I am 
could not hold you Veil tore before you Silence the boast of sin and grief The heavens are roaring The praise of your glory For you are raised to life You have no rival, you have no equal, now and forever, God, you reign, yours is the kingdom, yours is the glory, yours is the name of us. Death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. You silenced the boast of sin and grave. And the heavens, they are roaring with the praise of your glory. For you are raised, you are raised raised to life again you have no rival you have no equal now and forever God you reign yours is the kingdom yours is the glory In the name of Step down into dark. 
darkness Open my eyes Let me see That made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to see you're my God. You're all together lovely And all together worthy And all together wonderful to me King of all days King of all days You're so highly exalted Glorious in heaven above Only a king to the earth you created. All for love's sake became poor. Yeah, you put on flesh and you walk with us and talk with us. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to see. You're my God You're all together lovely And all together worthy And all together wonderful to me I'll never know how much it costs I'll never know how much it costs See my sins upon that cross, and I'll never know how much it cost to see my sins upon that cross. I'll never know how much it cost. To see my sin upon that rugged cross, I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon the cross.
Here I am to bow down Here I am to say You're my God You're altogether lovely Altogether worthy And altogether wonderful Oh, so wonderful Come, Holy Spirit, come. We need you here. We want you here. Come, Holy Spirit, fill this house with your presence. Fill this house. With your glory, even so come, even so even so come, even so. Spirit, we are absolutely nothing without you. We need you. We need your power. We need your strength. We need your comfort. We need your encouragement. We need your wisdom. We need your guidance. But most of all, we need the Spirit of Christ to help us to live even as he lived. So, Father, I pray today that the promise of the Father that was given to us so long ago would be our experience again today. And so we thank you and we praise you. And even as we look into the scriptures, as we look into this ancient text that has such a relevant message for us in our lives today, I pray that the Holy Spirit would enlighten us and empower us and help us to see Jesus more clearly today. In Jesus' name we pray. God. It's an awesome day. It's an awesome day to be worshiping together. Thank you, Gary, worship team. Thank you so much. Appreciate each and every one of you. Those that are videoing, those that are supporting in the sound system, we thank you so much. And we thank the Lord for your life, your testimony, and your, your worship. Hey, there's a really, really important announcement that I need to make uh, today and, uh, and prepare you for it. Um, a few weeks ago, I was talking to Pastor uh, Reuben, actually Bishop Reuben. Uh, Reuben Kowinzi is the uh, bishop that we have uh, known and worked with in uh, Kenya for so long. And um, in a, a moment of just real honesty and transparency, he had shared with me, you know, how so many of his pastors are suffering and really struggling because they're going through the pandemic as well and they're shut down as well. But unlike uh, most uh, or many uh, of our pastors in this country, there's no form of backup for them. There's no kind of uh, additional resources available for them. And uh, so they rely on odd jobs, but those jobs are also shut down. So I liken it to uh, Americans being in the front of the bus and you know, you hit a bump in the front of the bus, you feel it, you feel it deeply. But if you're sitting in the back of the bus, where I think the Kenyans are sitting much of the time in, the, in a developing country as, uh, as Kenya, um, you know, you hit that bump and it's, it's more exaggerated. So we want to do something for them. Uh, your uh, leaders here at Cornerstone Fellowship and myself talked and we decided we wanted to give um, a, a nice offering to the uh, Kenyans. So if you would prepare yourself for that, uh, we're picking Father's Day this year, which I believe is uh, June 21st. Uh, Father's Day would be the time for gathering that offering up. And so 100% uh, of it, every dollar that is given uh, during that offering and uh, throughout uh, you know, the month, if you want to designate for the Kenyan pastors, all that money will go to uh, Bishop Rubin's um, pastors over there. So uh, I'm, I'm just trusting the Lord that you 
you'll respond as graciously as you've been doing during this pandemic. I, my, I'm just amazed. I'm just amazed at how God has blessed you and how you have blessed us. And we thank you for your prayers and your support and your encouragement. As we look into God's word today, I, I want to take you to uh, the text that uh, Brother John read there at the beginning of the service in the call to worship from Acts chapter 2. This is where we get the word Pentecostal from, Pentecost, the day of Pentecost and the celebrations there. And uh, as, you, as you turn there, I'm going to just, uh, I'm going to call this message today, if you don't mind, I'm going to call it Burning Man. Now, I've got to give you a disclaimer on that one because uh, some of you might know that uh, Burning Man Incorporated is uh, an event that occurs out in the deserts of Nevada every year. And um, it's something, something like a combination between uh, Woodstock and Mardi Gras kind of all rolled up together. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of um, hedonistic lifestyle and uh, lawlessness, and, and it's by design. And sort of the, uh, the, the pinnacle or the climax of the whole thing is for the uh, people there to burn down an effigy that they had built. And it changes uh, every year. Some years it'll look like a man, some years it'll look like a, a structure of some other kind or some design. But they choose a topic every year, and uh, at the end of that uh, celebration, they gather around uh, the, the object, the effigy, and they light it on fire and burn it to the ground. And as it burns down to the ground, they sing and dance and revel. Uh, so, so the uh, event is called Burning Man. So I'm going to just plagiarize their, their uh, title there. And uh, this message has nothing to do with um, um, Burning Man, Inc. So uh, don't, don't make that mistake. Um, the reason I want to call this Burning Man is because I actually think that that phrase was probably inspired by uh, the testimony of John the Baptist. And we'll get to him in a, in a moment. But Jesus said that he was a burning and shining light that the uh, nation of Israel was willing to rejoice in for a season. When we think of Pentecost, there's, a, a, there's all kinds of imagery that goes with it. One of them, and John mentioned it already, is fire. There's also the imagery of wind. There's uh, the imagery of uh, tongues of fire or uh, the, the uh, glory of God shining down and distributed on each person who was in attendance. Um, some call Pentecost the birthday of the church, and it is, it is that because the, when, when Pentecost came, when the Spirit of God came on the day of Pentecost, uh, that was literally the birthing of the church. So some people call it the birthday of the church, and it is. Some people call Pentecost um, the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. Joel, in Joel chapter 2, he prophesied that our sons and our daughters would uh, would um, prophesy and our handmaids would prophesy and old men would dream dreams, young men would have visions. And, uh, and he talks about the phenomena that occur with the uh, outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So uh, some call it um, uh, the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy and certainly it is. is. But here's the one that concerns me the most is, is what has happened is that many people call Pentecostal or Pentecost the experience on that day and the people that have come from that uh, sort of a fringe element of or a sect of Christianity when in fact it is the original form of Christianity that the world knew and uh, came to Christ in. So I, I don't want to just relegate Pentecostals to a certain group of people who believe in praying in tongues or praying in the spirit or uh, uh, prophecy or other such things. It's much deeper than that. And I, I'd like to show you that if I may. Uh, Pentecost is actually a way of life. When the Holy Spirit fills uh, the vessel or, or the being of a uh, believer, um, two things happen. One is that uh, the Holy Spirit gets more control and the second thing is that we lose some of our control. We, we yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit. Not everything done in the name of God or in the name of the Lord is, is always correct or right. We understand that. You understand that. And the same thing is true in Pentecostal uh, worship and expressions. There have been people who have abused um, 
the different gifts of the Spirit. There are people who have taken advantage of them and distorted it. But by and large, the Pentecostal movement has been the, the fuel, the engine, the fireplace, the furnace, if you will, of the world missions and the, uh, the uh, dream of Jesus of reaching the world. So um, the fuel that fired early, uh, the early church was what happened to them in that upper room. Before we read that testimony and before we think about that just for a moment, I want to take you through a series of men. And uh, by the way, when I say um, burning man, ladies, I'm going to ask you just automatically shift it to women because it applies to you as well. I'm using man generically. You, you, uh, you make the interpretation automatically in your mind because I'm talking to men and women. And uh, certainly, down through the years, God has used men and women in this movement in powerful ways. But when I mention this phrase, burning man, I want to take you through some of church history and think for a moment about who these men were, who these men and women were, and uh, what God did and in and through their life. The first man I want to touch on, he's kind of the prototype, but we're going to go backwards then. The original burning man would have to be Jesus Christ. He is the one who came from the very heart of the Father with a message of love and passion from the Father for humanity. Jesus was moved with passion. I remember reading in Luke's gospel that when he met together with the 12 disciples, he said to them, you know, with desire, with fervent desire, we would say with passion, with passion, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Jesus was a man of passion. So let's just use Jesus as kind of a, the ultimate prototype. Jesus is the original burning man. And I believe that's true because he existed before time. And in the council of the Godhead, when God determined what he would do and what he would create and how it would turn, even before the foundations of the earth, Jesus had volunteered to come and to die for the world. What a passionate heart Jesus has. What an original and truly inspirational burning man Jesus would be. In uh, John chapter 1 and verse number 14, it says that the word, the word became flesh. And I want you to hold that thought. Jesus is called throughout the, the New Testament, the word of God, capital W. The word became flesh. That is to say that God's logos uh, became a, a human being. The word became flesh and he dwelt among us and we saw his glory Think about that. That's one of the, that is one of the indications that the Holy Spirit is present and active. John alluded to this a little bit earlier when he did the call to worship. That the presence of God always reveals himself. He always reveals himself in what we call glory. The scriptures call it glory too. The word became flesh. And the word was a sound. It, in the cool of the day... When Adam and Eve had finished their chores and their tasks for the day, in the cool of the day, God would visit them. And here's how they knew that God was coming. They would hear a sound. And uh, in the Hebrew, it, it, we translate it into the English most of the time as a sound. But it was literally translated in Hebrew as the voice the voice of God would come calling to Adam and Eve in the garden. And I don't know if you can think about paradise, especially during a pandemic, but if you can just for a moment, just in your mind's eye, just picture a man and a woman living in the environment that God had created for them so that they might reflect his glory in the world, so that they might rule and reign on the earth with him. And in that process, they would meet with God every day at the cool of the day. At the end of the day, just before night, they would hear the sound or the voice of the Lord calling to them and coming to them. And then they would know that he was there. When he would speak to them, 
then suddenly they were renewed and they were refreshed and they were uh, in many ways prepared for a new day because the voice of the Lord brings life. The sound of the Lord always brings life. I want you to hold that thought for just a moment. The glory of God revealed to Adam and Eve brought refreshing and renewing to their spirits and their souls. So Adam was the first of the human burning men. Adam and Eve would be the burning man and burning woman. Later, Moses would hear the sound of God coming from a burning bush. There's the same imagery, it's the same sound, and it's the same picture. Once again, uh, you know, Moses saw something that caught his attention. He looks over, there's a bush, it's on fire, it's burning up, but it's not consumed. Just like on the day of Pentecost, they saw fire as an image on the heads of people. It didn't burn them. It didn't hurt them. It didn't harm them. It literally filled them with the glory of God. So Moses saw this bush, and it was on fire, is burning. Some people would say, you can see that in the desert. That can happen. But for it to keep on burning and not to be consumed, now that was a miracle. So he drew near to see what this phenomena was. And as he drew near, he heard the sound of the Lord. He heard the voice of God calling to him. And he said, Moses, take off your sandals, the place where you're standing. That's holy ground. Moses would eventually become addicted to the glory and the presence of God. He would spend countless hours and sometimes days in the tent of meeting, in the place where God would reveal his glory to Moses. Uh, and, And in fact, the whole nation of Israel got to see the glory of God in the fire by night that covered them, that warmed them, that protected them. The glory of God and the sound of God was near to them. So Moses became a burning man. And literally for a while, all of Israel were burning men and women. There was another man going down through history very quickly. Elijah heard the sound of God. And when he needed to hear the voice of the Lord, it came to him not through earthquakes, not through phenomena in the uh, nature, in the realm of nature, even though God can speak through those things. What he heard was a very quiet, a very still, a very small, a low volume voice whispering in his ear, calling out to him. It was the sound of the Lord. And God was coming, and he was going to reveal his glory to Elijah. In fact, he had a destiny for Elijah that Elijah had actually never really attained to, never experienced fully because uh, of his own choices and decisions. So God spoke to him and said, I want you to anoint. And he names two or three different people that, that Elijah is supposed to anoint. And uh, one of the people that he's to anoint is Elisha, his successor. And after he had done that, and after Elisha had realized that God was going to take Elijah home, suddenly God caught Elijah up in a chariot of fire. Again, you have the imagery of wind, you have the imagery of fire, but it's all revealing the glory of God and the sound of the Lord being revealed uh, to, to mankind. So Elijah, he was a burning man. Um, when the fire fell on Israel and convicted her of her sin and her idolatry, Elijah was there calling on the name of the Lord. And then God took him home in a chariot of fire. Like Elijah is just known for these encounters with fire and the sound or the the, the voice of the Lord speaking unto him. Elijah was a burning man. So we've had Jesus, he's a burning man. We've had Adam and Eve, they're burning men and women. Also, Moses was a burning man. Israel was a burning nation. Elijah was a burning man. How about John the Baptist? John the Baptist in the New Testament now is a burning man. In fact, John was a bright light shining as a lamp. As I mentioned a while ago, Jesus said about John after he had, after he had died, after he had been executed... John the Baptist was a burning and shining, a bright light calling a nation 
back to God, calling people from their sin and their idolatry and their rejection of God back to the glory of the Lord and the sound or the voice of God leading them. And it had been a long time since they had heard the voice of the Lord. In fact, there had been 400 years of silence with no prophetic word, nothing from God. God had not spoken to his people uh, publicly or corporately. Maybe he spoke to some of them individually, certainly. But for 400 years, no voice from God, no sound is being heard, no manifestation of glory. It's nothing but chaos and dictatorship and, and, and war and uh, destruction, fires and desecration. Oh, so many terrible things happened during the 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament. But then John comes on the scene. And when he comes on the scene, he comes with a message from the heart of God, and he calls a nation back home to God. And I, boy, you know that God would just release his spirit on people today to call this nation back to God, back to faithfulness, back to devotion, full, full fidelity toward the Lord with hearts that are uh, given in passion and unreservedly yielded to him. John the Baptist burned with zeal. He was a sound, he himself was a sound, in the desert, calling men and women. John would cry out to Israel. He was the voice calling from the desert, make way for the Lord. And something in my spirit says that that there's a John the Baptist kind of anointing coming on the church where there is uh, literally men and women that God are choosing and he's using them to call a nation back to himself. John the Baptist was a burning man. He was truly a burning man, which would be then leading to Jesus himself. This message that John the Baptist had called a nation back, but it also revealed Jesus, who was the true Messiah, who was the Son of God, who was that word that had become flesh. So Jesus comes and he burns with zeal and passion from the Father's heart. His zeal and his passion caused him to walk into the temple one day and to see the corruption, to see the money laundering, to see the money exchanging and the selling of religious items for profit and for gain. And the zeal for God's house consumed him and he became filled with rage and he began to turn over tables. And I tell you, if you were on the receiving end of his whip, I think you would have known something of what God's holy displeasure is like when a people continue to reject God and walk in their own ways. Jesus was a man filled with zeal, not only for God's house, but for God's people. He taught them. He cared for them. And one of the promises that God gave us, this promise of the Father, the promise of the Holy Spirit, one of the promises, and Jesus reiterates it, is that when the Spirit of God would come, he would release power And the power was to be a witness, to be a testimony. And in Pentecostal churches, we we love power. We like the authority. We like the the power of the Spirit that, that creates opportunities for miracles and signs and wonders to be done. And I'm... I'm right there with you because truthfully, truthfully, many people need a miracle. They need God to intervene in their life. I've talked with, I've prayed with people whose lives were so desperate and they needed a miracle from from God. And God is so gracious and merciful, oftentimes he he releases that. But there's an aspect of power that is seldom thought about. Jesus, when he taught the sermon we call it the Sermon on the Mount. When he taught that, he said, blessed are you poor, the poor in spirit, for yours is the kingdom of God. You know, what people in poverty, whether it's physical poverty or spiritual poverty, what they, what they don't possess is uh, basic necessities for life. You, 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 you don't possess food. You don't possess adequate shelter. You don't possess... Uh, you know, sometimes uh, uh, good jobs and steady income. And when you don't possess that, you don't possess homes. You rent and squat or borrow or sofa surf, surf or whatever. You know, you move in with a friend, whatever. But 
One of the things about lacking food and basic necessities is you lack power. You don't have the power to stand in the community council or with the council of, of men and women and make your appeal to them. You lack basic power. And I think it's just beautiful. It's just so wonderful that Jesus would come to the poor and the peripheral, peripheral people, people on the edges, people pushed away by society, people without means and without power, and he would empower them. He's, he would say, I'm going to give you the kingdom of heaven. And you know, that literally happened on the day of Pentecost, is that Jesus took the poor and the nobodies, and he gave them power. And the power was to live a lifestyle that would witness of Jesus so that we would become zealous and passionate. We, too, would become devote followers. Jesus burned with truth and grace. Jesus burned with the glory of God. And just before he was crucified, he took Peter, James, and John aside, took them up to a mountainside, and there he was transfigured before them, which means he literally just let the veil of his flesh released, and he just allowed the glory of God that was in him to just begin to shine through him. Peter, James, and John testified later that they saw him on that mountain and they saw the glory of God. This was more than their friend Jesus, the fellow Galilean who had such a wonderful message. This was none other than the Son of God, and they saw his glory manifested. Now, I want you to hold that thought. That burning man, Jesus, he's carried the original flame all the way from back in the garden. He's carried it all the way through Elijah, Moses, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all, all the way down through Elijah, Elisha, even unto John the Baptist and even to himself as he stood there. And he begins to breathe on his disciples after his resurrection. And he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus is breathing into them the original breath that had been breathed into Adam in the beginning. And so they were born again. They were transformed by the saving work of Jesus Christ at Calvary. What an amazing picture that is. And he says, receive the Spirit. Receive his Spirit. And that was good. And I believe that they received his Spirit. And I believe that they were changed. I believe they were transformed. I believe that they went from sinner to saint and became wonderful believers in that day, in that moment. But they were not yet burning men like, like Jesus, like John, like Elijah, like Adam, like all the others I mentioned. They were not yet burning men and women. That came in the testimony that we read in Acts chapter 2. So they had waited together for 10 days. They had prayed. They had repented. They had aligned their hearts with God and with each other. They had come into a unity. And now in Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared, it, appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. That sound that came from heaven was the sound that, Ab uh, that Adam heard in the garden when God would come. It's the sound that Moses heard when God had called his name. It's the sound that Elijah heard. It's the sound that John the Baptist heard. It's the sound um, that we hear today. And that sound that was released on that day was more than just the tongues or other languages. It was that, but it was much, much more. They were literally experiencing the infilling of the glory of God. And as the glory of God came upon them, they began to react in all manner of ways. But the first thing that happens 
after this event, it, it, it no sooner happens than they release a sound. That sound that they release is the sound that they had heard. It was the original sound of God that came to that garden. It's absolutely amazing, absolutely wonderful that they began to reverberate with the sound that they had heard. And they took that sound, they took that message, and they went around the world with it. And that message is still transforming lives today. Now, here's my point. What they experienced in that upper room is continued down through history to this very day. And I want to tell you that God is ready to release his glory again on the church. And he wants to fill you with his glory and his presence. And he wants to release a sound from you that gives witness and testimony of Jesus Christ. He wants you to experience that sound. And I'm going to just tell you my own testimony is so when I was a 19-year-old kid, the Holy Spirit came on me and I released the sound. And I've been releasing that sound ever since then. And uh, I pray that you would as well. In fact, I want to ask you that question. Will you become a burning man? I became a burning man. Would you become a burning man? You don't have to become like me. What we want to become is like Christ. Let him guide you. Will you wait for it? Will you pray for it? Will you repent for it? Will you align yourself? Will we align ourselves together for it? Will we unite together for it? So God, please help us here today to become burning men and women. Would you please pray with me? Father, I thank you for the testimony of Scripture because the testimony of Scripture is sure. And because we have the testimony uh, in Scripture and we read that, as soon as we, as soon as we recount the story and the testimony, it gives you the privilege and the proper environment to do the same thing over again. The testimony that we have just shared here today, you can repeat it in, in, in and through our midst. So, Father, I ask you to begin to release your glory into your people today. Begin to fill your people again. We need to be filled and refilled and filled again. We need to drink deeply of the Spirit of God and be full of the Spirit every day of our lives. Lord, we don't want to be just called and labeled Pentecostals, a, sort, a certain sect of Christianity. We want this to become our lifestyle. So help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you tonight on the Zoom call.